but again. Um, well, what is, uh, I might just not be understanding or I'm hung up on your use of the word infinite. I mean, does it, does it follow that if space is infinite, there are copies of us? Not only from that, but you can have an infinite Euclidean space, you know, and then with nothing in it except for here. With a Boeing but, but what's so beautiful about inflation is it doesn't just make infinite space. It also has this energy, which is present at the end of inflation, which turns into particles. So it's not, in, not empty. And moreover, it, it generates these tiny fluctuations, so it's a little bit different here from there. Basically, if you go somewhere far, far away and look at the stuff, the particles start out in slightly different places with slightly different motions. And um, as a result of that, every possible arrangement of stuff will, will happen somewhere. I'm just, and, and from those... So, so I don't know if I'm convinced of that. I mean, I understand the argument. But, I mean, like, we can have an infinite set that... that there are different sizes of infinity, right? You can have an infinite yes, set yes. that doesn't contain... Yes. Uh, the missing members, right? Like a set of even numbers. Uh, it doesn't follow that... I mean, you can have an infinite set, right. but there's yeah. still pieces that are missing, right? Right. So, so there are two separate issues here. The first is, if you do have this kind of ergon, this kind of uh, statistically uniform infinite space, where you're rolling dice... You're getting fresh roll of the dice in every horizon volume or whatever. Then, since since uh, the probability that this happens isn't zero, which follows from the fact that it did happen already, and you get the roll of the dice infinitely many times, it's going to happen in elsewhere too with probability more than infinitely many times. But then there's a second part of it, which is does inflation really give you that? And for that, I should turn it over to Andre. Yeah, we we in fact. Uh, a year ago, we were with people with Manchurian supported by the kids. <laughs> okay. Where we estimated the, uh, the total number of multiverses, which is equivalent to the question uh, how many maxes exist. Um, oh, okay. Closely related. Uh, be because indeed, if we study this. Um, uh, configuration of galaxies around us. There is just a fixed number of these configurations when you... Uh, well, it, it's, it's all related to the issue of entropy of uh, gravitational perturbations produced during inflation. And if Busa would be here, uh, the, uh, the argument would be something like that. That actually not, not all of these uh, uh, possibilities are distinguishable by an observer who lives inside the universe because he can see only the distance one divided by the square root of the cosmological constant. So people who live in the space with smaller cosmological constant, they can enjoy a much greater variety of universes and your copies. We may be according to the logic may be used to justify why lambda is close to zero because they may have much more experiences in these universes. But, but, but then you also, that's kind of fun, with, uh, sorry for lengthy answer because it's not an answer, it's just a kind of strange uh, mentality which we came through and we were discussing similar things. In the end, it ends up by also this, that if, however, you say that I am Max Tegmark and I weigh, however, well, 80 kilograms or whatever, right? That's nine. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good We are all very honest here. So, so according to the Bekenstein theorem, <coughs> you cannot have more than certain amount of experiences. And therefore, if you're calculating your quantum mechanical probabilities, they're bound mostly not by the cosmological constant and the size of the universe, etc., but surely by your weight. And that's a very good point, which is very related to this, because for this argument to work, you don't have to have exact copies of, of Bruce McWilliams. You just have to have yeah. people who feel exactly the same subjectively. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, Bruce, for whatever money, cannot have more than certain amount of breakfasts. The total number of breakfasts any of us can have 
is limited by some huge, huge number, but absolutely unbeatable. Okay, yeah. so. <laughs> and when we say, we, when we, the normal way we teach quantum mechanics in, in, in our classes, right, is we say, first you make it, you prepare the state, like, the state of yeah. the system, and then you observe. What do we really mean by prepare in this context? Well, if you, you know the wave function of the universe, preparing just means you use conditional probabilities. You say, well, I happen to know that I put, my name is Max, and I put the experiment here, and I measured, I measured spin yeah. up in the x direction. Mm -hmm. That just means of all the, that means, oh, it's not that guy, it's not that guy, it's not that planet. Mm -hmm. It could be this planet, or this planet, or this planet. So, I, the maximal preparation I can do is to take into account everything I know to narrow down where I am. And then the point is, there's still going to be many of me. Which I think is consistent with what you're yeah, saying, because the, I am yeah. finite. The total amount of maxes, okay, uh, limited by the biggest end bound. As long as your radius is smaller than <laughs> 3 meters, then you can calculate the total amount of experiences which you can ever yeah. have. So we just thought it was, we thought it was really interesting just that something like in the nature of space on large scales which seem like it has nothing to do with quantum mechanics actually does. Sometimes things have very surprising connections to, to other fields.